survey can range anywhere from five to ten thousand dollars, depending on how complicated your lot is and if there are existing survey markers there. Um, and then lastly, the distance from your main house can also trigger things like fire rating, not only on the ADU, but on your existing unit, having to go back and retrofit that to be a certain fire. Absolutely agree. And we actually had to bring permitting in-house for this exact reason. The first couple of years we were operating, we used a third party to process that part once we'd done the designs. But for the exact reason you just mentioned, you'd find out they dropped the baton and it just wasn't fast enough. So making sure that... Hi, everybody. Jose Luis Morales here. Welcome back to another episode of the Morales Group Show today. Today, we have Whitney Hill. She is with Snap ADU, and today she is going to teach us how to plan, design, and build an ADU. Welcome to the show, Whitney. How are you? Doing well. Delighted to be here. Thank you. Yeah, I'm excited as well, too. So for our viewers that maybe don't know who Whitney Hill is, who is Whitney Hill, and then how did you get involved in the world of ADU construction? Uh well, I'm the co-founder of Snap ADU. We are a general contractor based in Greater San Diego. We design, permit, and build accessory dwelling units, also known as ADUs, Granny Flats, Casitas. They're much more popular in California as of a few years ago when the state decided to pass regulations making it much easier to build ADUs. I found my way into this space about four years ago when we uh, founded Snap. I had just heard about those changes in regulation. And at the time I was working in residential construction um, on the East Coast, actually working remotely. Um, mm -hmm. We had moved out to San Diego um, a few years prior and I was doing flips out there on the East Coast. And uh, the nature of the work we were doing was expanding the square footage of existing small homes by adding a second story. Um, and I started to get first in construction that way. I was starting out as a financing partner on those deals, but quickly got into some of the weeds on the construction side as well and realized that um, there was you know, a lot to um, bring to the table from my previous experience in operations management and strategy uh, consulting. So uh, then I met someone um, who was looking to enter the ADU space as well out here in California. So he was a general contractor and we partnered up and quickly um, you know, established ourselves in this market and scaled to become the largest design build contractor of ADUs in San Diego. I love it. Congratulations on that. So what I wanted to do in today's show is I just basically wanted to help people that are considering making an ADU. I wanted to answer like their most frequently asked questions. I wanted to see if maybe you had any tips as it relates to the design process, the construction process, and maybe ideas as to what it costs, how long it takes. Um, so if you don't mind, we'll start and we'll get started. So um, if somebody was considering building an ADU, what's like the first thing that they should do? The first thing to do is to find out what your jurisdiction will allow. So at the state level, there is often a floor set for a minimum of what must be allowed on each lot. But then each jurisdiction can layer on their own regulations as well. So understanding what your specific setbacks and size requirements are, as well as how many units you can build, is, is very important to understand. In general, on single family properties in California, you can build one accessory dwelling unit and one junior accessory dwelling unit. Um, the difference there, um, a junior ADU is carved from existing space within the existing home up to 500 square feet. So think a garage conversion, something like that. An ADU uh, can be a standalone structure, can also be built onto the existing structure, um, can typically be up to 1,200 square feet, though some cities have limited it to just 1,000 square feet, which is allowed for the state law. Some have even said, let's go bigger, and you can go up to 1,500 square feet. So again, depends on your jurisdiction. Um, for multifamily properties, even just having a duplex on your lot, all the way up to apartment complexes, you're allowed to build up to two detached ADUs, and you can also convert existing um, uninhabitable space, things like garages, carports, laundry rooms, can also be converted to accessory dwelling units. On top of this, the city of San Diego, that jurisdiction specifically, has added a bonus program for ADUs. So in addition to everything I just discussed, you're also allowed to build additional units if they conform to the floor area ratio for your zone, um, and if you deem the first one an affordable unit, meaning that you restrict the uh, rent rate for that unit and also the income level of the tenants there for a period of 10 to 15 years. If you build one that conforms to those affordable constraints, you can also build a bonus ADU at market rates. So in some situations, folks are able to build four or six units uh, because of this bonus program. Which I love, which is phenomenal. Um, would you say, and this is, I think, one of the challenges that I have, um, 
would you say that the first step as well too is to do that do that research yourself or would it be to reach out to somebody like you if you're in San Diego um, and the reason I ask that is I have found that whenever I have clients go to the city directly, there's a lot of misinformation with some of the different cities and some of the different cities actually discourage certain clients from actually doing it. So would you say it's actually better to find a professional that specializes in that? And if so, what should somebody look in that professional, like maybe like an architect or an all inclusive company like yourselves? Yes. Um, and you're right about hearing inconsistent responses from the city. We see that all the time. There's turnover at the city, just like there is anywhere else. And sometimes they're dealing with you know, very junior employees and attrition. And so folks looking at those regulations um, might have a different interpretation. You could submit the same question and get two different answers. Um, and even if you're looking at those regulations yourself, the reality of how those are interpreted both by the plan checker and then ultimately by the inspector in the field can look very different. So working with a professional who has seen those actually play out in practice can be extremely helpful. So it's smart to get yourself educated on the basics as well so you have some idea of the terminology. But like you mentioned, I completely agree that going to an expert who has done this many times over, oftentimes much more than the city employee has even had to review those projects. Because keep in mind, plan check um, reviews are happening for all kinds of building projects, not just ADUs. They're happening for new home builds, they're happening for additions, for solar projects, for electrical upgrades, for residential, commercial. So plan checkers don't have as many chances to see those either. Um, and quick side note about us specializing in ADUs. That was what we felt was so important for us to get up to speed in this space quickly. Uh, a lot of builders will do myriad different things and ADUs is but one of those. They also do kitchen remodels and bath remodels or new homes or renovations. And we found it was so important to get really good in our niche of detached ADUs. And having done over 100 of these now, we're able to have enough at-bats with the cities to see how these things actually play out in practice so we can say with credibility of what we would expect in a given scenario. And also keep in mind these rules are fairly new, and you're also dealing with the intersection of state and local rules. So there is some gray area for interpretation. And working with a builder or an architect who has some experience here and knows how to push back on cities when you feel an interpretation is not correct can mean the difference in tens of thousands of dollars as well. So getting the input of a professional very early in that process is for sure key when you're starting to plan an ADU. I love it. So I saw some plans, I think, on your Google business page that actually had uh, like different floor plans of different one bedroom units, different two bedroom, different three bedrooms, different four bedrooms. Can you tell us a little bit about why those plans are there? And uh, and maybe how that can actually make the process easier for people maybe in San Diego, but maybe there's companies out here in different parts of the state that do very similar things as well too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's really only so many ways you can put together a 1200 square foot um, ADU plan. And if you're going for a smaller one, <laughs> that holds true even, even more so. So we find that starting with you know, a, 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 a something that's off the shelf can often save a lot of time in trying to figure out what exactly could work with your property. So the first step with the floor plans is really to figure out what is the buildable space on your lot, which will help you start to narrow down what size of a footprint and then help you start to pick plans. So the plans that you see on our website are sort of a library of a place to get started. Um, since we are a design build firm with both of those um, those talents in-house, we're able to very quickly modify any of those plans to suit. And we do that on nearly every project. I would say maybe 15% of people actually take something straight off the shelf and use it at it as is. Because when you're working with a property that has existing constraints, like your distance from um, the different uh, trees and fences on your own lot or the distance from the main home, a lot of times an existing plan, the way the windows and doors are laid out, doesn't work quite um, quite right with the existing um, situation. So we're moving things like that. Or perhaps you just have a usage um, that you'd like to um, ad you know, adapt the inside um, but as far as the room size and something like that. So we're often tweaking our plans. And then lastly, the exterior will always need to be customized to match your main home. There are a handful of jurisdictions that will let you go rogue and do a totally different look for your ADU, but that's unusual. It's most typical to blend it with the primary. So having that um, starting place for the floor plans gets you into a real conversation quickly, can give you an idea of the cost for that size of a unit with that level of spec. Um, and from there, you can start to refine all the additional costs to consider for your particular property. Got it. Now, if somebody was price conscious and was designing an ADU, is there a certain way to design that ADU to make it like 
more more cost efficient on the construction aspect of it. Like I had a different guest the other day. He told me like for every corner or every corner that you add, that could be like ten thousand dollars or something like that because it you have to lay foundation a different way, you have to uh, frame a different way, etc. Um, are there any design tips that you can give to our viewers? That's a great one. Keeping fairly simple footprints um, when you can will definitely cut down on costs. Um, using uh, trusses instead of conventional framing can save on costs, which is something we do in all of our builds. Um, making sure not to add interior footings in your design um, can also save a lot of cost. And when you're working with a design build company, that's a, a real edge because a lot of the um, implications down the line, if you're just working with an architect, they're not thinking about the cost of the added interior footings that could have been avoided. Um, other good tips would be to make sure that you're using standard door and window sizes. And this was even more important during peak COVID when supply chain issues meant that the lead times on things were you know, six months, something like that for some windows. So by using standard sizes that are readily available, it, it makes a huge difference in cost and really doesn't change the livability or look of the unit. You know, a couple of inches difference on a window isn't going to make or break the look. Um, another good tip is to make sure that your bathroom sizes are designed such that you could use a standard standard size insert. Again, the difference of a few inches can make or break this. So thinking through the sourcing down the line for that build can also be very important. Um, also, I would talk about the positioning of your ADU can significantly affect the cost. Um, not only from a site work perspective, of course, a flat part of your land is going to be much cheaper to build on than if you're having to do some braving or if you're having to build a raised foundation to account for the grade difference. Also, if you're placing your ADU within six feet of a property line, you will trigger fire rated construction on the unit, adding easily five, six thousand dollars because of boxed eaves, higher fire rating on the windows and that sort of thing. Um, so while you can build at four feet from the side and rear in most jurisdictions and in the city of San Diego, you can actually go to zero foot lot lines right up against the property line. A lot of times we advise folks not to do that because it's going to trigger fire rating. Another thing it might trigger is the need for a survey for your property. So in some situations, cities will require a survey anyway, no matter where you're putting the ADU. That's that's really uncommon. That maybe about 20 percent of the of the jurisdictions in our service area do. And in a lot of cases, you don't have to provide a survey unless you're getting so close to those property lines and setbacks that you're going to have to prove that you're not encroaching. A survey can range anywhere from five to ten thousand dollars, depending on how complicated your lot is and if there are existing survey markers there. Um, and then lastly, the distance from your main house can also trigger things like fire rating, not only on the ADU, but on your existing unit, having to go back and retrofit that to be a certain fire rating. So even just the position of your ADU is absolutely vital in understanding the true costs um, of your build. Um, we could got, talk about the site costs too, as they relate to utilities and some other watch outs there. There's a whole checklist of these that we go through because having built so many of these, We've, we've stubbed our toe on every piece of furniture in the room at this point, and we like to make sure that we know those up front so that someone can adequately budget for the entire project and not have a change order come up down the road. I love it. I love that. Um, I think what I got from that as well, too, is uh, if you're designing your ADU plans, get your contractor involved or go with an all-inclusive firm because I think that's a really common mistake where people – the architect will design something without taking any of the costs into effect. And we're uh, designing a, a home right now. And our contractor's like, no, you don't want to design this because of this. This is going to add this or this is going to trigger that. And I think that's a very good tip to either go with a firm that's all inclusive or to make sure that your contractor is involved in that process. That way you can optimize it from a cost perspective. So, once you design your ADUs, how long are you guys typically seeing that these take in San Diego County? I know that it varies county per county and even city per city in some cases. What would you say is normal for San Diego and does it vary by city as well too? Absolutely varies by every um, jurisdiction that's doing the permitting. Um, in our area, so again, across the 15, 18 different jurisdictions, we're seeing between three months at the absolute fastest getting through permitting to eight or nine months in some of the worst situations. And the things that um, affect that 
Um, one would be um, the staffing levels at your city. Just how fast are they turning those permits around? And that varies too. We, for a while, city of San Diego was backed up and every permit was taking eight, nine, 10 months. Now, basic ones are getting through in three or four months. I say basic. If you're involving something like coastal or historic review, those can take longer because different agencies have to review it. Also, if you're doing something like the bonus affordability program, like I mentioned, that has an extra review with an outside agency. So all those are things that affect the timeline. Also, some studies have different approaches for how they will review your plan sets. Some will have um, all the departments looking at it in parallel, which obviously makes it much faster because you're getting comments from everyone at once. Some, though, will force you to do them in sequence, meaning that they won't even have the building department look at your plans until they've been passed through planning which again, because of city queues, can mean that you're adding months and months. That's where you get into the nine and 10 month um, realm. So um, all those are factors. And then also how fast is your architect or design build firm turning around those revisions? We track all that time um, in segments so we can see what our turn time was and what the city's turn time was. So we can really pinpoint those bottlenecks and say, say with credibility, the reason this took nine months you know, it was 70% the time it's been at the city versus 30% in our revisions. And of course, there's going to be some time with revisions. That's also something that folks will ask us a lot, of a lot. you know, why are you getting this back to revisions? Is that, is that normal? Is that a mistake? And it's absolutely expected. Again, having, having done more than 100 of these, we have an ex extensive checklist to make sure that we're getting all of these, having all these comments accounted for that the cities have requested historically. But because the code is perpetually changing, you also have constant turnover at the city review, and each property is different. Sometimes you're truly asking the question for the first time. It's, it's unheard of to make it through on the first round. The best we see is one round of revisions so that you end up being in front of the plan checker twice. Yeah, I think the big one there too is, and I had some issues there where the very first architect that I ever hired to build some ADUs, he would tell us that the city was being delaying, delaying, delaying. We called the city and it turns out that the plans were there by the city for the last two months and he hadn't just picked them up and he kept brushing it off, like almost like if it was the city. So I can't stress to our viewers how important it is to work with a company that tracks all that information and who it understands the importance of that because if you hire the wrong architect you hire the wrong uh person this process will be a nightmare if you hire the right company it'll actually be a lot smoother there'll still be hiccups but it'll just be a lot smoother than it would if um if if you hire the wrong the wrong person Absolutely agree. And we actually had to bring permitting in-house for this exact reason. The first couple of years we were operating, we used a third party to process that part once we'd done the designs. But for the exact reason you just mentioned, you'd find out they dropped the baton and it just wasn't fast enough. So making sure that your interests are aligned with your partner is also important. And us being designed permit build, we want to get these th things through permitting as fast as we can, because the longer it takes, the more our costs are going to come up. And now we're at risk of not making money on this project because our costs have gone up, but we've locked in the, the construction price. So our interests are aligned and wanting to get this through as fast as we can. Yeah, because obviously you guys have already agreed to do the project for a certain amount. So if costs go up during that time, then there's basically a risk, more risk associated uh, there. What are some tips as it relates to getting that process done faster with the, with the city? Well, I would say first having a good understanding of what they're going to require and, so to speak, what color of ink they're going to want. That sounds so absurd, but it's true. Some of them will even stipulate the formatting of your plans and exactly what details have to be included. And there's some similarities across jurisdictions, but there are also little nuances. So working with an architect or a drafter or design build company cool. who regularly works in that jurisdiction is super important. Um, and then I would also say that um, having someone knowledgeable processing the revisions is vital as well. Um, having someone be able to look at those and push back when they're not required or push back when it's already there. Um, having someone truly versed in those requirements, working the revisions with the city is also very important. I love it. So basically, I think that what I'm getting from that is just having somebody local because different jurisdictions are going to operate different ways. And if you already know what they're looking for, it makes it a lot easier than thinking, hey, look, I've gone ADUs approved in Los Angeles. Ventura County should be similar. No, it's going to vary based on every jurisdiction. So I, lo I, I love that. So from the time that you get the plans approved, um, how long is the construction process typically take? The construction will take six to seven months. 
depending on the complexity of the site and if you're doing a two-story or larger build. Um, the small, you know, 600 square foot, one stories are going to go maybe even under six months. If we're having to do two stories, we're involving um, a few different trades than you would otherwise. Or if you're building a larger unit, you're simply going to be on site longer. Um, so anywhere from you know, right under six months to seven months is typical. Got it. I will say we're probably faster than average, though. Um, we've pushed really hard to reduce all those timelines by working with the same set of subcontractors, meticulously managing it in our project management software and just you know reducing the downtime that we have. So we, we see ourselves as pretty fast. Yeah. What, what would you say like, uh, like people could, ex or what is, uh, do you, does your company do like a price per square foot? Does it vary based on the plan? How, what are you typically seeing that people should expect as it relates to building ADUs? And does it vary if it's a junior ADU versus an actual, uh, detached ADU, um, or a garage conversion? Or are you guys doing those as well too? And are those, more price effective than ground up. So if you can maybe go over those three different scenarios, I think that would be helpful to our viewers. Yeah, let's do. So there's a big difference in detached versus any sort of renovation um, conversion project. And mm -hmm. we again, we specialize simply in detached new construction because it is so different and we wanted to be very good at what we did. Um, but to describe um, some of the pros and cons, um, conversion of existing space, can absolutely be cheaper than building a new structure. Um, you already have some of the infrastructure in place. There are bigger unknowns when you take that approach. You're working with existing conditions and we don't know uh, what the engineering was of those structures. We don't know at what level of um, compliance you're going to be when you start opening up walls. So it puts you at bigger risk of variables. So for that reason, uh, that's why we don't actually work on those projects because we aren't able to offer that predictability to our clients. Um, however, if your building is in relatively good shape, it's a, you know something that's been built in the last 30 years, going with a conversion likely makes a lot of sense. In some cases, we might be looking at an old garage, and we find it's cheaper to scrape it and start from scratch. Um, one, you're getting it all up to code, obviously, but two, you're likely better able to use the space when you're starting from scratch on something like an, in, in a very old garage that's not worth saving. Um, as far as your question about junior ADUs and also your attached you do also get into con different considerations for things like requirements for metering and utilities. There are slightly uh, more relaxed requirements for conversions than there are for new construction. Um, there are also not requirements for solar on any conversions of existing space versus new construction over a certain size and also in a certain climate zone will, will require a um, solar system to be installed with the new construction. So those are some of the various um, constraints that you're working with there. Um, as far as permitting timelines and you know that perspective of it, um, about the same on those kinds of projects, you're going through the same steps in, in all regards and cues. Um, build time, again, really gonna vary on how much retrofit work you're doing and what kind of a company you're working with. Um, again, just a lot more variables with, with renovation work. Um, to answer your question about budgeting for cost and do we think about cost per square foot or um, use some other method, um, you, you can ballpark something on cost per square foot, but it's very important to be clear about what you're including in those costs. So I would take a step back and, and first just paint a picture of all the different cost buckets that go into an ADU project. Um, first would be your plans, getting the plan set drafted for the city and putting together the application. Second would be the permit fees that you're actually paying to the city itself. Now, while a lot of these fees for ADUs have been waived, there are still a number of them due. And depending on your jurisdiction and the size of the ADU, it's still going to be anywhere from $5 a square foot all the way up to $20 a square foot. Um, and this, again, is whether the city is going to charge for sewer connection fees, water meters, um, how much they charge for building and plan check fees. Um, to give an example, City of Encinitas has waived nearly everything. You can get something permitted there for a couple of dollars a square foot on average. Meanwhile, City of San Diego is charging for a lot. <laughs> You're paying closer to $20 a square foot for permitting there. Now, it's still better than it was you know, 10 years ago for ADUs, but still need to budget for it. So plans, permitting. Next, you're going to want to budget for your general site work. Um, that's the basics of what it's going to cost to connect your utilities to the ADU and get the building pad ready for the unit. 
you're also going to need a budget for what we call general conditions, which is all of the required um, safety measures on site, dumpster, temp toilet, um, BMPs for things like um, drainage. So all those will have to be in place as well, no matter what project you're doing, how big, how small. Then <laughs> we're getting to the vertical build cost of the unit itself. And like you mentioned, a lot of those costs you can see on our website for different sized units. But just to give you a flavor of that structure itself and the finishes, um, a two bedroom, one bath, 750 square foot unit, for example, would be around $270,000 for that part of the build for the structure and the finishes itself. Um, as you're going bigger, you're going to see some economies of scale there because often you're just building that cheap space that's not a bathroom, not, it's not a kitchen. You're just expanding the footprint, and that's relatively cheap once you're already there and mobilized. The mm -hmm. cost to do a bit more construction once you've already got the trade there is, of course, um, cheaper for every square foot you're doing. And then last, back on these cost buckets, um, it's all these site-specific factors that you need to budget for. Um, do you need a separate electric meter? Do you need to add solar based on the specs of your unit? Are you on sewer or septic? Do you have an undersized um, sewer line? Do you need to upgrade the size of your water meter? Um, are there electric lines in the path of your ADU? What's the path of your utilities? How long will the run for the utilities be? We have a checklist of 70 items that we go through for each property to really pinpoint what all of these different costs will be. We also talked about planning appropriately and um, understanding that upfront. Mapping out the actual locations of the utilities is something we do in every first phase of a project, which we call feasibility. Um, this gets skipped in a lot of projects. Then you end up digging and finding out that you've got the sewer line running right where you wanted the ADU to go and you have to reroute it. Oops, $5,000. So needing to find out exactly where those run up front is paramount. Um, and so to wrap all this up, what are we looking at for, you know, average cost per square foot, just to give you an idea? Um, the smaller units are going to be very expensive. Um, you're still building a kitchen and a bath. You're still doing the plans. You're still having to mobilize and have all that um, basic site work done. Um, you're going to be at around you know, $550 a square foot all in for everything you need to get that unit built if it's a little guy. Um, if you're building a 1,200 square foot unit, you know, three, three bed, two bath, you're going to be closer to your 350, 375 a square foot for everything I talked about, including permitting. Um, so again, talk, use caution <laughs> when talking in cost per square foot, because sometimes you'll hear a very low number like, oh, 200 bucks a square foot. Um, maybe they're just talking about the shell of the build, no finishes, right? Maybe they're talking about prices three years ago, which is a huge, huge difference. The inflation, as it has affected every other market, of course, has hit us in construction extremely hard as well. Um, the overall cost increase in the last just two years has been about 40%. So it's just not going to cost what it did five years ago. So you're also having to kind of reset expectations on what just the basic building costs are going to be for construction. Are, are you seeing most people do separate utilities? Uh, one utility? Our utilities usually, usually uh, what are you seeing as it relates to utilities? Yes. Um, this gets quite detailed, and if somebody wants to go deep, there's articles on this on our website. Um, but for electric meters, you're going to be required to have a separate meter for each ADU that you add. Um, for uh, water and sewer, you are allowed to tie in, quote, behind the curb, which means from that lateral that comes off the main trunk line in the street, you're able to tie in there. Now, the reason that's important is that if you're not doing right-of-way work in the street, it's going to be much cheaper than having to establish um, a new lateral connection. Um, so that's the basics of how we're doing water and sewer. Um, as far as you know, separate metering for those, it's typically not required. But if you're doing an ADU for a rental, some folks will add a private meter so that you're able to monitor the water that's going specifically to the ADU. Got it. What are you typically seeing for like financing of ADUs? Does your company help people with that? Do you guys, uh, are they typically getting like a home equity line of credit? Are they getting like a private uh, second? Are they getting credit cards? Are they paying it from their 401k? Are they paying it cash? How are most of the people financing them? I've seen everything you mentioned for sure. I would say the most common now, given how high interest rates are, no one wants to do a refinance, obviously. Um, so a, a fixed uh, rate second position loan is very popular right now. And some of those do have term lengths of 20 years with 30 year amortization. Um, so that's the most popular right now. Um, and we do find that nearly all of those loans are tied to still needing some equity in your main home. Um, people ask us this all the time, you know, is there a construction loan where it's based on the future value of the property where I could un you know, unlock some of that potential? Um, and while, yes, that is a method that they use, 
almost always a secondary qualification is to make sure that the overall loan value does not exceed a certain percentage, um, which means if you don't have some equity in that home, there's almost no way you're going to be able to finance it right now. Um, I will say that while it's made it more difficult because of the rates, of course, um, we have seen some traction on a national level for counting ADUs in financing situations. Um, it's been very difficult to get ADUs to appraise in the same way that um, just a regular property would because there aren't many comps. There's not an established um, method for doing this yet. Um, however, um, recently the um, Federal Housing Authority has allowed counting the rental income from ADUs towards the qualifying criteria for a loan, which makes it much easier to do a refinance once you do have that ADU built and you have an established um, rental income source. There's no seasoning period there, so you can immediately refinance out of it. Um, so that that is positive momentum on that front. I love it. Um, are you seeing any financing for second loans for investment properties? And if so, who who typically does that? Because I've heard uh, other investors. I I was uh, shopping around when I was doing some ADUs for investment properties, and we had a go private meeting. We had to find individuals that were willing to lend us the money on a private second note. Um, do you know of any banks that do that type of financing for investment properties or are they mainly for primary owner users um, for the second loans, uh, 20 year amortizations or whatever? Yes, um, we've seen exactly what you're saying, where if it is an investment, you're needing to get some sort of private financing for it. Um, we've we've not seen many options and we've explored a lot lately um, trying to find different ways for folks who come to us and say, hey, how do I maximize the value of this property? I want to build six of them. I'm in the city of San Diego. Let's, like, let's do this. Um, it's extremely difficult to find an off the shelf product and you're having to go with private lending sources. Yeah. And that's kind of because I'm going to be in a position where I own a 25 unit apartment and we're looking to build six ADUs and we're in the permitting process. And a part of me is like, uh, my private money guy may not want to do it because he's like, look, I don't want to be in second position to a $4.3 million loan because if you default on the first loan then, uh, or you default on the second loan, then basically I got to cover the first. So it uh, just looking for different investment uh, uh, bankers, I think there's an opportunity there for the industry. And I think that once that gets taken care of, that's going to help a lot more investors uh, be able to build accessory dwelling units, which I think would help the industry just in general in terms of more affordable houses and obviously more construction, which means more jobs and just a little bit of overall for everybody. You're hitting the nail on the head. Financing is the, the number one problem we see. And most of our investor clients now you have outside funding from something or they're getting a, a loan against an existing property and not the one they're building on. Um, so you're absolutely right. There's so much um, demand for this. We actually looked at these numbers when we were looking at financing. Um, and just in the last year, we had had 1,100 different people approach us who needed financing for an investment ADU and couldn't get it. Um, huge untapped demand um, in this area. And I fully agree with you. Yeah, I went private and luckily that helped me out tremendously, but we had to talk to a bunch of different people. Um, so what are some of the challenges that you're seeing as it relates to like ADUs? Like what, what what are the concerns that clients are coming to you with? What are some of like the stories that maybe you've heard? Like, hey, I was doing my per plans over here. They didn't happen. Or, hey, look, my project is halfway being finished and I can't get a hold of the contractor. I read some guy that was pretty big on social and I saw that he went bankrupt from building ADUs as well too. And like people were complaining that, um, that he wasn't getting back to them. So it's like, uh, what are some of those things that you're hearing about the ADUs? What are some of the challenges? Where do you see the industry going? Yes. <laughs> Where to start? <laughs> All the examples you gave, we've definitely heard um, as well. A lot of times we'll have folks come to us after a first ADU project where they wanted to do it themselves and manage some of the trades and they found out what a headache that was or how difficult the permitting was. Or maybe they did work with an all-in solution, but they weren't happy with the results. Um, so we definitely hear those kinds of stories. Um, but as far as challenges specifically, um, as we talked about the cities, um, getting straight answers early in the process, very tricky. And to some extent, you're having to make a judgment call on how, you know, how confident are you in your answer before you start spending money to design this thing, um, because it's going to cost you a minimum 10000 or so to get a full set of construction documents and 
in some cases, the additional property reports like survey that you need to submit to the city and get the formal answer. Um, so one um, tactic that you can use there, a lot of cities will offer some sort of a formal review process. It does not necessitate an entire set of construction documents. So you could get away with spending more like $2,500 to do your floor plan, elevation, site plan, the basics, and put that in front of them for a formal paid review. Um, we've done that on a few projects where we were able to get great feedback that saved us designing something that wouldn't have been allowed because of some strange nuance. So anytime that we're in a weird zone or we have a funky um, plan that we're proposing, maybe it has a roof deck or it's got two units in a, a historic zone or something like that, it's not clear in the regulations, we'll, we'll often suggest that to a client to get some formal feedback and feel confident before moving forward. Um, other problems that we find, you know, it's it's highly complex on the utility side. Um, working with um, SDG and E has a huge lead time as well. So we talked about the separate meter, electric meter that's required, and I kind of breezed over that. <laughs> at this point, we're pros and know what we're doing because we've done so many of them, but that has at least a six month lead time on it. So now we know that for every electric meter request, we need to put it into SDG and E when we start the plans. So we have that request in while we're doing the plans and permitting so that we're all aligning on time. And the first time or two that we didn't do that, we had an extra couple of months on the whole timeline because we didn't sequence it, we, we didn't do it in parallel, we had to do it in series. Um, so I think the biggest difficulty is that there's so many elements that come into play here. Um, and like I said, it's not just regular construction, It's it's got all these state laws layered on top of it. You're always working with existing conditions that are affecting what you're able to do as well. So just the number of variables is very, very hard um, to, to get through um, with any real accuracy unless you've just done it so many times. Um, and then lastly, I would just say the costs on all the extras. Um, so in general on a project, besides just the build, the structure itself, you're planning on $60,000, $80,000 on average for plans, site work, general conditions, um, all the upgrades we talked about with solar and required metering, maybe demo on your site, something like that. Um, so it, it does add up. And per square foot, these end up being expensive because they're so small. If you were doing all of those things for a 2,500 square foot house, obviously the cost per square foot is a lot lower. Um, so we often are dealing with folks who are just surprised on the overall cost of doing this. They thought it was going to be $100,000 to build an ADU, and it's just nowhere close to that. Um, so, you know, that's, those are a lot of the factors. We also see some pushback um, from HOAs. Um, we've gotten pretty versed in this, though. We've done about 25 HOAs at this point. Um, legally, from the state regulation, the HOAs cannot, quote, reasonably prohibit the building of an ADU. Um, it's all about interpretation, though, what's reasonable. Um, so we've gotten good at involving the HOAs early, getting their feedback alongside uh, the city feedback so we can just incorporate it all at once in the re revision process and avoid like a protracted experience with the HOA. But sometimes you come across HOAs that are just non-responsive, you know. So again, needing to push back um, when needed to keep things moving. Um, just a, a last thought on this. Um, I don't think anything that we do is particularly magical. It's just that you have to execute on so many fronts that very few people are willing to be that diligent. Um, just the, the level of follow-up and meticulousness that's involved in this, um, the bar is high from just the perspective of not everybody's going to put in the effort and time. It's not like it's brain surgery. It's just a lot of steps. So all the checklists and, and project management that we have behind the scenes um, has really been what's allowed us to, to stand out in this field and just continuously deliver. Um, because if you don't have those processes in place, even something seemingly simple, um, if you allow it to be in someone's head instead of in a system, it's just likely to be forgotten. So we've been um, extremely diligent on the project management front. Which I love that. It almost reminds me of our systems for selling real estate. Like anytime we ever experienced a problem, we would go back and document that problem and create a process so that that problem never happened again. And even when you were talking about the electrical as well, too, it's the same thing where now you guys order it up front versus maybe somebody experiencing that problem for the first time. So what I love about your guys' system is that you guys are creating processes, systems, procedures to be able to eliminate a majority of the problems. Yes, are you guys going to encounter new problems? Of course, but a majority of them are already taken care of as well too, which I can't stress how important it is because like, let's say you have your project sitting for six extra months and let's say that you got a home equity line of credit where you drew a certain amount of money. You've got monthly costs associated with that. Not only that, but you've got cost that the property is not being rented for as well too. So sometimes people are like, well, I could save 10,000 here or 20,000 there. I tried to project manage it myself and combining that with selling a bunch of real estate, I 
wasn't focused enough, it wasn't worth it. Now I don't, I, I want nothing to do with that. I'd rather pay more just to get it done. And I think for most people, sometimes they don't understand the importance of that. They think like, oh, I could do it cheaper or I could save twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000. But the reality is that if it doesn't get done in a timely manner, if it doesn't get done right, if it delays it six months and there's other costs associated with that. Um, I did want to get a little bit of information about like dealing with HOAs, like because I haven't heard of too many people getting plans approved through HOAs. Most of them, like almost the advice that I get is stay away from HOAs. So what's the key to getting those uh, done? And is it mainly detached, uh, attached, um, garage conversions or junior ADUs that you guys have done with HOAs? We've only done detached with HOAs. Um, so I would say the, the secret here is get the HOA guidelines as early as possible. We ask for them the, in week one of the kickoff. So we read through those and make sure we already know what level of matching is going to be required for the HOA. Um, other washouts with HOAs, they might require things like story poles. They might require um, you know, particular building um, materials match their palette of approved um, items. And you know, we've worked in the hardest HOA. We've worked in Rancho Santa Fe at this point. So it's, it's the granddaddy of them all. And we've been able to get an ADU through there. Um, so it's very much doable. This just comes back to my comment about needing to have a cohesive um, vetted process for doing this. And again, because we're design build, we're able to quickly figure out, all right, this design requirement is coming back from the HOA. We didn't plan on that. What's the cost? We go out and we did it. We get that answer from our pre-construction department and we're able to immediately feed that back to the client and let them know what's going on. Um, but again, anticipating that up front, you know, you shouldn't um, assume you're going to be able to do asphalt shingles in an HOA if your house has um, tiled roof. So just being smart about that up front. Same thing with things like recessed windows or grids in the windows um, or Santa Barbara stucco finish versus um, some sort of a rough coat. All those have cost implications. So knowing that you're going to need to match that from the from the jump is going to help you with that budget accuracy. So honestly, HOAs aren't an, are not at all a non-starter. Um, it just means that you're needing to be a bit more diligent in the design and just know you're going to match the existing house. Or or uh, the ones that you haven't been able to do with HOAs. What's been the reasoning for that? We haven't had a single one shot down in an HOA because they can't by state law. Um, the only scenarios we've seen people not be able to build H build ADUs in sort of an HOA-esque environment. If somebody has come to us um, with um, like a condo situation where uh, they have CC&Rs and they have a couple of houses that kind of share a common space, that's where there's true ambiguity in the regulations. Is it the first person there who gets to build an ADU? Would they have to get sign off from their neighbor that they can build that ADU and they don't get to? Um, we've had a couple of people approach us with that scenario, and we've been very honest that we don't know how that would play out. <laughs> we would have to you know, kind of see what happens when we submit it. You have to see what your neighbor's going to say. So again, this all goes back to the state law saying reasonably prohibit, and HOA cannot reasonably prohibit. What does that mean, right? So again, if you have a company that's willing to go to bat, we actually have a lawyer on staff who does our permitting and regulatory. Um, we're able to effectively um, position it so that we're getting past these laws and making it possible for the HOA to say yes. Um, it's a question of how much money and time are you going to spend to getting them to say yes. They're going to have to based on the state law. I love it. Any final words? And then if somebody was in San Diego and wanted to uh, build an ADU, how could they get a hold of your company as well too? Sure. Um, well, that part's easy. Let's play for that first. SnapADU.com has all of our contact information and just a wealth of resources about um, what it takes to build an ADU. Um, we've taken the approach of, Full transparency. So from day one, almost four years ago now, we've been putting everything we learn on our blog or on the regulations pages that we have for each city. So not only are you getting a distillation of what the regulations are in your jurisdiction, you're getting our commentary on what we actually heard from the plan checker or what answers we received during a conference. So you're getting that added layer of practicality that I don't think you're able to find in a lot of places. You're also able to research all the ins and outs of all the utility stuff I mentioned, um, all of our watchouts when you're working in certain zones. 
um, what to know about cost and budgeting, the full list of the 70 things to look for. Um, so I would say, what do I want people to know? Um, take advantage of the free resources out there. You know, there's there's a lot more information about ADUs than there was four years ago. Um, so you know, take the time to get educated. And I think also just making sure that when you do go to start getting bids, make sure that everything is apples to apples. And it seems very obvious <laughs> as I'm saying it, but you'd be surprised. Um, it doesn't mean getting a bid for framing from two different contractors. It means making sure all those extras I talked about with your site and utilities, any required reports for your jurisdiction. If one builder is telling you that you need that and the other person is not, examine that and make sure that you decide who you think is right and that you're budgeting for that across the board so that you can really compare your bids. I love it. Good. Well, I want to say thank you for taking the time to be on the show. I enjoy how detailed oriented your company is. I enjoyed the processes as well too. Uh, that's typically what I like to hear whenever I'm working with somebody that they, they're creating processes and systems to make the process a lot uh, better. Um, so thank you. Uh, for our viewers out there today, we had Whitney Hill. Uh, we talked about how to plan, design, and build an ADU. Uh, she is the co-founder slash CEO of Snap ADU. If you've enjoyed this episode, make sure to hit that subscribe button. If you feel that this episode would be helpful to somebody, make sure to hit that share button. Whitney, thank you. Thank you again. And to our viewers, until next time.